Tom, I don't know if you can change it, but um, I'm the University of Exeter rather than the University of York. <laughs> that was a... He can say what my mind was thinking as I was just saying head to right, <laughs> wasn't I? Thank you. All right, easily done. You can put University of York next to me if you like. Well, I'm all right. <laughs> we all know. <laughs> Shall I go on then? Okay, everyone else happy? Happy, thank you. Tom. Hello. Um, maybe worth waiting just a couple of minutes after two o'clock just to make sure if people click at two o'clock, it might take them a little while to get through. So sure, I'll wait something like uh, yeah, I, another three minutes, I'll wait then. Okay. Hello to all those with us. We're going to wait another couple of minutes just for those participants who are clicking onto the onto the presentation screen. So just bear with us another couple of minutes.
Okay, I think we'll um, get started now. And so good afternoon to everyone who's joined us for Southwest Marine Ecosystems Fisheries webinar um, this afternoon. So it's, um, my name is Tom Hooper. I'm uh, chairing this session together with Professor Martin Attrell from the University of Plymouth. And we've got four speakers for you who will be speaking over the next hour. Then we have a, an opportunity to have a, have a chat and discussion on their talks and uh, other interesting topics. Um, I'd like to introduce the four speakers. There's Matt Slater from Cornwall Wildlife Trust, who's talking about the, the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide. Uh, Ros McIntyre from CFAS um, on her work to, to look at the uh, edible crab and European lobster fisheries in the Southwest as part of an ongoing study at CFAS. Then Lauren Henley, who's a PhD student at the University of Exeter, who's been studying the, the fisheries and, and management of the, the live wrasse fishery. And finally, uh, Dr. Bryce Stewart from the University of York, who's become the, the uh, expert. He's on a lot of uh, media. I see him cropping up all the time talking about Brexit. And he's been brilliant at really trying to untangle the, the truth from the reality around Brexit and the implications for the fishing industry um, and kind of wider sectors uh, in, in in the UK. So it's been great. I know that two of you were, were have been forwarded from the uh, Southwest Marine Ecosystem 2020. So and, and one of the great things we're able to do is, is bring in some other speakers and have a really good focused discussion on, on fisheries as part of this afternoon. So um, I'd like to hand over now to, to Matt Slater. I'm going to stop sharing this screen and hopefully seamlessly we'll, we'll join Matt where he is in Cornwall. Thank you very much. Okay, just going to share my screen. Hopefully, hopefully everyone's got that. Have you got that, Tom? I can see it. Yeah, that looks great. Great. Okay. Well, thanks for the introduction, Tom. Um, my name's Matt Slater from Cornwall Wildlife Trust, and I'm here to tell you about our Cornwall Good Seafood Guide project, which this year is in its sixth year. Crikey, doesn't time fly? Um, the aims of our project, it was um, set up to help um, people, so businesses and consumers make well-informed choices when they choose seafood. And the idea is that we're bringing together all of the information available on local fisheries in a format that people can easily understand and use. Um, we want to promote best practice and highlight really sustainable Cornish seafood and in turn incentivize further improvement. Um, so after all, you know, conservationists and fishermen have got a lot in common. I mean, healthy seas are not only vital for our marine wildlife, but they're also vital for our sustainable fishers. So here's the website. If some of you, um, some of you may not have seen it for a while, we recently um, re, re um, branded it and it's looking really good. We've got some new features here, including a, a download of all the recommended species. Um, it works brilliantly on a, on a phone as well as on a computer. But what do we actually mean by sustainability? Obviously, it's um, a complicated matter. There's no perfect way, really, of judging sustainability. Um, at early stages of the project, our independent advisory board um, discussed this at great length for a very long time. But eventually, we decided that the best thing to do, rather than create something completely new and out on a limb down in Cornwall, we thought it'd be better to work with an existing system. So we're we're um, pleased to have been partners with the Marine Conservation Society since the project launched, and we used their wild capture ratings methodology, which is available on, on their website and ours, if you want to get more detail on it. And um, it's a, a quite a simple system. Each fishery and fishing method gets given three, um, three scores out of one, and they're multiplied by different factors depending on the, the three different um, categories and then you end up getting an end score, which ranges from one as the best and most sustainable to five as the least best. So those three categories, as you can see, is stock status, and that's fishing effort as well as um, species um, spawning stock biomass. We look at the management and we look at the capture method and its ecological effects. And when it comes to communicating, uh, quite an early stages in the project, 
and we decided rather than um, using the numbers as our main method of communication, we decided to to come up with a recommended symbol. And I'm not very good at numbers, and I'm sure some in the audience <laughs> are like me. And so, yeah, rather than using numbers, we decided if, if it's got a one, two or a three, it's on our recommended list. And this is our recommended logo. Um, and that can be put next to species and capture methods that, um, that are in that bracket. And so when you click on a fish on our website, there's loads of information. And if you're in a rush, you can just read the sustainability overview, which gives you a really good idea. Then you can look at the different scores for the different um, methods of capture for that species. Um, if you don't understand what the methods are, you just click on the learn more and it'll take you straight to the gill netting page, for example, or the trawling page. So, yeah, it's a great educational tool. And, and a lot of people would probably just look at that front page. But as you scroll down, you've also got lots more detail and lots of references and, and documents, etc. And um, we also have loads of other good features on the website, including um, information on why we should care. Um, we've got all the different species listed. We've got recipes, we've got how to videos. Um, you can meet the fishermen and learn about the fishing industry. So it really is a, a, a great resource and it's been um, in, proved to be very popular. Before our website came along, there are actually in Cornwall, if you, were care, if you cared about sustainability, we only had two fisheries in Cornwall that are MSC certified with the blue tick. And we found that many of our uh, fisheries were actually missing off the Marine Conservation Society's Good Fish Guide project. Um, so the feedback as well we were getting from the industry was that sometimes a good fish guide didn't um, didn't respond very quickly down here and the, there were some disagreements about the ratings. So we decided to sort of try and fill in that gap, make sure that Cornwall's fishing industry was properly represented. And, and as many of you know, there's many of our Cornish fish stocks are also data poor. So we only currently have 25 percent of them actually um, studied by ICs and in, in good condition. So it's, you know, before our project came along, it was actually quite hard to figure out what was sustainable, what wasn't. It was a very big task. And um, we ended up looking at 130 species and capture methods. Over 60 species were analysed. And um, we ended up with about 57 of those combinations as rated as recommended, which is 43%, which is pretty good. But actually, if you look at the value, because each, not all fish is, the same, some fish are a lot more are landed in a lot bigger quantities. So if you looked at in terms of value, it actually equates to 67% of corn, Cornish um, landings are recommended as sustainable. So I think, you know, overall, we're doing the fishing industry quite a favour, really helping get the information out there and highlighting good practice um, and being a trusted independent organisation not linked to the fishing industry. I think our, our point of view is really valuable. So we launched in 2015 and since then our audience has really been growing. Um, so the first year we had in June 2015, we had 1,600 users and last June we had 15,000. So that's a pretty good increase. <clears throat> uh, lockdown was extremely busy and um, we now get about 4,000 uh, users per week. So the traffic has been really impressive and it's really shown us that it's, it's needed. We also work with a lot of businesses and our businesses help get the message out there to the customers and to the public. And because, uh, you know, we, we can't advertise this ourselves. These guys are basically advertising it for us and showing that they support our project sort of endorses them. So we've got a great directory with 122 businesses that have been involved with the project. And we also work with a lot of fishermen in the last um well, before lockdown, we, we carried out a series of workshops, really trying to skill up fishermen and get them interested in, in the platform that we've created that helps promote them and their good practice. And during COVID, we, we were very busy promoting uh, small scale local fishermen who found that their markets had disappeared and traffic to the website, as I said, really went up, which is great. And it really proved that, um, that local people do want to support uh, sustainable fishing. So what are the most sustainable options available to us? Well, farmed mussels and oysters have uh, got a very good score, as have wild caught Pacific oysters. And you might have heard me talking about them at, uh, in the Benthic session of the Southwest Marine Ecosystems Conference a few weeks ago. Uh, we've also got the native fishery for oysters in the Fall Estuary, which is under sale and all, very sustainable. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing seaweed 
although it's still really in its infancy, the seaweed industry in Cornwall, it's, it's very sustainable. And uh, line caught mackerel, obviously mackerel are protected around the southwest by the mackerel box. So it can only be caught in uh, this low impact sustainable method, which is great and very, uh, very good. So um, overall, uh, some of the trends we're seeing, we're, we're finding that um, in the recent years, um, warmer water species are really being favoured. And obviously we get these natural fluctuations, but it certainly feels like the, the warm fluctuation is really dominant at, at present. And species like hake and sole are doing really well, megrim, monkfish, sardines. And the latest CFAS report shows that sardines are, are really uh, doing well, and massive stocks of them around the southwest. And even species like spider crab, which are quite heavily fished, we're seeing, you know, um, really good landings per unit effort coming from the IFCA reports recently, which is encouraging. But other species aren't doing so well. So generally, the cooler water species really are kind of um, struggling. Um, cod, whiting, both of those are no longer on our recommended list. We're going to hear about crab in a minute from Ros, um, but certainly there appears to be a lot of fishing pressure on crab and possibly. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if they're in if they're in the climate change bracket as well. We'll, we'll hear more, I expect. But certainly at the moment, they're they're in trouble. And, and bass um, were across Europe really struggling, and ICs were um, recommending very very low catches of bass. What we're now pleased to see is a slight upwards trend in stocks of bass, which is great. But um, but you know we really hope that this stock can fully recover. In Cornwall, we're, we're unlucky. Well, in the southwest, we're unlucky. There's many species that are highly valuable that aren't actually closely looked at. So lemon sole and scallops, for example, new, um, both of those are data deficient, but very valuable, as is turbot, pollock, cuttlefish. So we are unlucky and really more research needs to be done. And there's just a few species that we're currently a bit concerned about. Certainly cuttlefish, very data poor, very low levels of management and they're being targeted quite heavily by trawlers and by potters inshore. Uh, crawfish, well obviously um, you've heard me talk about them at this conference as well, but crawfish are becoming really abundant around the southwest, but management hasn't changed and the current management we've got is very similar to the management we had back in the 80s when crawfish all disappeared. So I would argue that, that needs to be looked at. And finally, uh, tuna. Um, I haven't really got time to go into it in big detail, it's a hot topic. But apparently we now have a small quota and how that gets allocated is going to be very interesting. And we, we fear that if we're not careful and it's not well managed, it, it could become uh, pretty uh, uncontrollable because there's certainly a lot of interest in, in fishing, both recreationally and, and commercially. So um, finally, how can a fishery get a better rating? Well, it's um, there's three different things you need to think about. So improving that quality of data that shows how healthy the stocks are then looking at the management and you, you do very well if there's a good management plan in place and you've got catch limits and i.e. or effort limitations, things like protected areas. And in, in my opinion, good engagement with fishers and fisher led management also really lends itself well to a good management score. And then um, improvements in fishing methods. But it's important to point out that if one fisherman um, adopts um, something that really is beneficial. That can't change the score of the whole fishery. It needs to be adopted by the entire fishery, um, ideally. And there's some examples there of things that, you know, that could be done um, to improve that. But a lot more detail is on the wild capture ratings methodology PDF. Um, so finally, there's still definitely a need for this sort of work. And this uh, 2020, the guys at Sweep, um, led by Ocean Marcon, carried out some, um, some surveys and they showed that most people still buy 85% of their fish from supermarkets, <clears throat> but that 75% of people would be willing to pay a little more for local sustainable seafood. So that was encouraging, but there's a lot more that still needs to be done. We want to see this project continue. You know, it's always a challenge funding this sort of work. So we're looking for funding and potential partnerships and collaborations. We really think that, um, as I said, Fisher-led management is the way forward. So we're open to ideas and we really want to use the website to highlight good, good news stories like that. We want to support low impact inshore fishermen to continue to improve domestic markets. Certainly Brexit, as we'll hear from Bryce, has thrown up a few problems for marketing of seafood. We want to continue to see reduce, re reducing bycatch. 
and uh, we want to carry on highlighting best practice to incentivize improvement. So if you haven't signed up already, please go on the website and sign up to our newsletter. And I, should, I have to shout out to Abby Masterson, our uh, marketing officer. He's done a great job this year at really getting the message out there using our social media platforms. And, uh, and thank you to all of the businesses, all of the fishermen and our funders and everyone else involved on our advisory board, etc. For for a great six years. Thank you. Thanks very much, Matt. It's great to see the progress on this on this tool and particularly how, how important it's been through lockdown and helping access to to some of those local fishermen um as martin says if you've got questions please put them in the chat at the end of this um we'll ask uh the the speakers to come back on to to answer questions so thank you again matt for that talk mm -hmm. um we'll pass on to ros ros mcintyre from cfas um as Matt says, Ros has done some really important research uh, on the edible crab and lobsters, which was published at the end of last year. Um, certainly from the southwest point of view, these are incredible, incredibly important species, incredibly important uh, fisheries. So the data that we're getting and how this is collated and presented is, is really important. So I'm really pleased that Ros is here to, to speak about that. OK, thanks, Tom, for the introduction. Um, I've been working on shellfish at CFAS for over 10 years and one of my main roles is to run the crab and lobster stock assessments. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the fishery, past, present and future, which will put into context the stock assessments, which I'll explain in a bit more detail. First of all, I'll give you some facts about the, fish, uh, the species themselves. Um, crustacea are difficult to age. It's only fairly recently been discovered that you can use calcified, look at calcified growth rings to um, age them using the eye stalk or the gastric mill in the stomach. This is time consuming and expensive, so it's not widely done. They molt, so growth isn't continuous, it's, it's more step, step changes, and they're long-lived, um, and molt frequency decreases as they get older, so growth rate slows down. Females, female crabs in the channel migrate west, and some of them go very long distances all the way across the channel. They, um, they when when they're incubating eggs or they, they stop on soft sediment and bury into the sediment to incubate their eggs where they, they stay, they don't feed, they don't move for about six months. And when they've released their eggs as larvae, they, they then get up and, and carry on. Um, all of these things and more have implications for the fishery and the stock assessments. For example, the, the female crabs aren't when they're not feeding, they're not active in the fishery, so you don't tend to see them. Okay, the past. The um, pot fishery has been at, around the southwest for centuries. It's um, a lot of harbours were built around this industry, and it's it's well suited to these these small harbours and coves. It was a lot of small boats working inshore. And the rocky coastline we get around the southwest is perfect lobster habitat. Traditionally, they used inkwell pots, which were made out of withy, um, which then moved on to metal frames with synthetic mesh. It was a seasonal fishery with uh, very weather dependent with small inshore day boats. It's still mostly an inshore fishery particularly for lobster, but there's a, there's a big fishery for crab in the mid channel now, as well as further offshore around the coast. The majority of pots now are parlor pots and more of the fleet is expanding to fish offshore. There are big vivia boats now that can fish year round and they can stay at sea for several days. They're a lot less weather dependent. They can keep their catch alive in seawater tanks on board so they can land them live. Um, in the last few years, a new market has opened up in China where 
top quality crab are shipped live. So the price for crab has gone up a lot for this premium product. It's more of a volatile market, but it's also very valuable. 2020 was not, uh, not an easy year for fishers with COVID lockdowns, um, markets disappeared overnight. And this was followed in January by Brexit. But I think everyone's optimistic that 2021 will be a lot easier. Okay, I've got the landings in effort here for, for crab and lobster. Um, the light blue bars are over 10 meter boat landings and dark blue is under or 10 meters and under and the lines are effort in days fished. So you can see uh, about three quarters of the landings in the Western Channel are from boats that are 10 meters and over. Um, similar, it's probably about two thirds in the Celtic Sea and lobster more landings are um, done by 10 meters and under, so smaller boats. But this isn't representative of the number of boats in the fishery. So we have in the Western Channel about four times as many boats that are 10 meters or under than 10 meters and over, which um, contribute a smaller pr proportion of the landings. Again, with the Western Channel, it's a similar story. And Southwest Lobster, there are a lot more small boats. So it, it's more of a small boat inshore fishery for lobster compared to crab. And on to the stock assessments. We do length-based stock assessments where we estimate exploitation rate and stock size. These are produced every two to three years and they are regional assessments. So the crab, we, we assess the Celtic Sea and Western Channel in the Southwest and the lobster, it's, it's the Southwest. It's a bit harder to see that plot below, the map below, but it's, um, it goes from the Bristol Channel around to Lime Bay. We've tried to make them as user-friendly as possible um, as concise and easy to understand as we can with, with no jargon. And they're available online on the government website below. The models we use are length cohort analysis and yield per recruit model. So the length cohort analysis produces estimates of fishing mortality by looking at the change in numbers of animals caught by length and accounting for natural mortality and growth parameters. Yield per recruit assumes a number of recruits to the fishery and projects them forwards. It applies natural and fishing mortality to this. And these numbers are then divided by the number of recruits to get per recruit estimates. We use length weight parameters to get weight um, also, proportion mature and fecundity by size give us estimates of yield, spawning stock biomass, or number of eggs by size class. It's not easy to condense um, an assessment methodology into a few lines, but hopefully this will make it a bit clearer how they work. The inputs we use. We get length samples from boats landing. CFAT has stuff around the country that go down to, to ports when boats are landing and to merchants and measure the catch. We also use total annual landings from log books, buyers and sellers and monthly shellfish activity returns. And we raise the individual samples up to the annual landings, which gives us a, a total annual length distribution for each region. We use parameters in the model, natural mortality, which we assume for crab is 20% and lobster 15%. Growth rate, maximum size, and the maturity parameters that I mentioned in the pre previous slide. The outputs we publish are four key indicators to give us overall sustainability status of the stock. So minimum landing size, this is very relevant. Um, 
but the minimum landing size is set to allow at least 50% of the stock to reproduce at least once before entering the fishery. Discard survival rate, we assume to be close to 100% in pot fisheries. The exploitation rate and stock size are outputs of the model. So fishing mortality is the exploitation rate and spawning stock biomass. And these are calculated in relation to um, conservation reference points, which is essentially maximum sustainable yield. So what we've got here is a plot of fishing mortality by size. Blue is um, male, red is female, and we, we get an average for, from that, uh, an annual average of fishing mortality. So these are the latest assessment results for Crab Western Channel. First, we have the length distributions. You can see red is female, blue is male. It's a female dominated fishery. We didn't have enough data for male to do a male assessment as landings are so low for males. So you can see fishing mortality in the middle. It, it's fairly stable. Um, the dotted line is the maximum sustainable yield target. So it's quite close to that and the limit is off the scale. Biomass is, is again fairly close to the target, but it has been declining for a few years. It's, it's above the limit, so the status of, of the stock is moderate at the moment. Celtic sea crab, similar. It's, it's again a female dominated fishery. Uh, fishing mortality and biomass are fairly stable, both of them I have been for the last few years, and they're both above um, or both above the target or between the target and the limit. So again, the exploitation status is moderate. Lobster, the sex ratio is fairly similar. You can see the, um, it's quite a steep length curve here, but there are some big animals out there. You can see there's a bit of a tail there. Fishing mortality, it, it's between the target and the limit for both sexes. Uh, again, the spawning stock biomass and both are fairly stable. So again, the status is moderate for this stock. So the outcomes, the status of crab and lobster in the Southwest is currently moderate. Trends are mostly stable, except for biomass in the Western channel for crab. Um, it's been decreasing for a few years, so we need to monitor that closely. But assessment results are indicative rather than, oh, sorry. Assessment results are indicative rather than absolute. They, the output show trends over time. The model assumptions are the population is in equilibrium. The whole population is equally available to the fishery and fishery statistics are complete and accurate. We've got anecdotal evidence of an increase in pot numbers and uh, an expansion into offshore fishing grounds, which we can't account for in the model either. So we make the best of the data we have available, but they should be treated with caution, the assessment results. So the future, is there a risk of overfishing? Pot fisheries are one of the most sustainable types of fisheries there are in that they're a passive fishery and animals have to be actively feeding and enter the pots to be caught. The minimum landing size is also a very important safety net in that it allows a lot, most of the stock to spawn before they get caught. So you've always got that replenishment of larvae to the fishery. But effort is increasing and fishers will potentially have to work harder to maintain their catches. Management is currently just technical measures. So we've got minimum landing size and a lobster buried ban. Uh, IFCAs have their own measures as well, their own bylaws, which include maximum vessel size, permit schemes, escape gaps. Um, who knows whether these will be sufficient in the future or 
we'll have to move to um, more finfish kind of management with quotas and TACs. But for now, it's still a thriving industry throughout the Southwest. And we, we don't want to lose the local infrastructure or the industry that surrounds it or the heritage that we've had for several hundred years. And I'm optimistic that we won't have to. Okay, um, here are some references for from the stock assessments, but um, other than that, thank you for listening. And um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Thanks, Rose. I see, Rose, I've seen some questions coming through already there in the chat. So we'll hold those. And um, if you can see them, perhaps you can, just, you can already prepare your answers. But from my point of view, I'm really pleased that, that you joined this session. It's such an important area of research. You know, just from my position in, in Scilly, the, the, the crab and lobster fisheries are so critical to the economy. So it's really good to, to really understand that data and how you've presented it. So let's, um, yeah, thank you. And let's, let's watch this space and um, uh, we'll, We'll let you go now, Ros, and but stick around and come back in in half an hour or so for the the, the Q and A session. Okay, piece of research. And I just, from my point of view, that collaboration with IFCA has really sort of shined through, and also how how challenging it's been, hasn't it, for the last three or four years to really you draw on the science and implement the management, and hopefully, and you just you realise how difficult it is to to really get it get it right when the the, the information is changing and the fishery is changing all of the time. So it's a, it's a really good piece of work and I'm really, really pleased that collaboration has worked out. So um, stay there, Lauren. And um, I know Martin is gathering the question. So um, if you um, hop out of this session, we'll invite um, um, Bryce in. Hopefully you're there, Bryce. Um, so I, one of the advantages of, of going uh, onto an online session is that you can invite people from outside the southwest and all the way up to york and bryce i thought would, was a great addition to this session not least because it's also complicated the un understanding um brexit and the impact on fisheries fisheries research fisheries management and and all of the economics and and, and social aspects has has been so pivotal to us and there's nobody better i think than than bryce to explain this um in really simple terms and he's even quite often been prepared to actually get his crystal ball out and explain what's going to happen in the future so i'm really pleased to have Bryce for this for this session and um over to you thanks very much tom uh yeah great to be invited here i wish obviously i was in the southwest at the moment uh maybe uh sometime in the future so i'll just get my presentation up Okay, so yeah, Brexit and beyond. Uh, let's see what happens next. So just like to start by thanking um, some of my funders, the ESRC, and also some of the organizations I've worked with down here. But like most projects, this has involved a multitude of different people. And I'm really just the mouthpiece. So we all know about uh, Brexit, hard to avoid it unless you were living on the moon. And of course, who can forget the flotilla on the Thames? Coming from Australia, my uh, my friends and relatives down there just thought that was absolutely unbelievable, that site. Um, and I, I must admit I was with them. So the common fisheries policy, as we all probably know, has been the cornerstone of uh, management of European fish stocks since the 1970s. And that of course includes uh, the ones around the UK as well. It didn't have a great history, um, either in biological or economic terms. Uh, there was a large amount of overfishing for a number of decades. Um, and there were some pretty severe sort of uh, cuts to fishing boats and things like this that went on. And probably if you dug through the internet, you could find quotes from me um, sort of criticizing it fairly heavily 15 odd years ago. The UK of course is no longer bound by the common fisheries policy. Um, but the ironic thing is that it was just coming good. So after the reforms in 2003, and then particularly in 2013, We've actually seen a, a recovery of a number of fish stocks because of the more sensible management, particularly following the science more closely as well. 
And also somewhat ironically, the, the UK actually has the most profitable fishing industry um, in Europe as well. So despite all of that, obviously, it, uh, Brexit was well supported by the fishing industry. Not everyone, and that's a key point, because the fishing industry is a very diverse industry. And when you dig beneath the surface, you realize there were actually a lot of different opinions out there. As for my involvement, I was actually a somewhat uh, originally reluctant player in all of this. Uh, a former colleague of mine, Charlotte Burns, came to me towards the end of 2015 and said, no one's thinking about the environmental implications of Brexit. And uh, we've got, we're going to write this report and would you like to be part of it? And I was like, absolutely no way. I said, first of all, it's not going to happen. And second of all, just to think about it just blows my mind, you know, to undo uh, 40 odd years of legislation was just too, way too complicated. But anyway, she's very good at convincing people and me as well. And eventually I joined the project and we produced this report here about all the possible environmental implications. This came out in April 2016 and it, it ultimately went on to win an award. But actually what was probably more significant was this article I wrote in the conversation, which um, got seen by a lot of people and sort of put my name out there as a, as a Brexit pundit. So uh, yeah, somewhat unintentionally, I became a bit of a pundit. It, it was a bit of a different experience as an academic because you know writing scientific papers is what we normally do, but there was no way that could keep up with sort of how fast this situation was moving. So yeah, I did publish a few papers, but most of the dissemination I was doing was via blogs and reports, seminars, and Twitter, for those who know me, was actually very important. Lots of students got involved, um, couldn't have done half of this work without them. And uh, yeah, funnily enough, uh, this Aussie here from the sticks ended up speaking in parliament a few times, which was quite fun. And I, I worked out just the other day, I did over, I've did i done over 100 media interviews um, on Brexit, including a number on television. So yeah, it was all a bit different. One of the more significant pieces of work I think we did was this um, uh, output from a number of workshops. And I'll just boil it down to a few key findings here. What we've got are the opinions of the various different stakeholders. This survey was actually done in 2017. Um, and we basically asked them for their priorities on a number of different issues, and then we split them up into these groups. So if it scores a four, it's a, it's a high priority. And then the colors sort of fade down to a one, which is either not mentioned or low priority. So encouragingly, the first thing was that everybody's top priority pretty much was sustainability and also a sort of a strong governance system and well-enforced management. Um, and, and so that was really positive to see. If we focus just on the commercial fisheries section, and again, remember that this is not one section. We actually did some follow-up studies that dug a bit deeper, um, but Fundamentally, what they wanted, no surprise, more control over our waters, more quotas, an exclusive zone inside 12 miles. That was really a red line for a lot of people and a better deal for inshore fisheries. But at the same time, both the, the industry, the catch sector and the processing and export sector obviously wanted to keep the, um, the zero and low tariff export market that we had with Europe. So trying to keep as much of that frictionless trade as possible. And this was really the fundamental issue. And this is why fisheries came to dominate the headlines in terms of Brexit, um, very surprisingly, given the sort of small contribution to GDP. And fundamentally, we had this, these differing opinions. So the UK here saying, you know, we're going to take back 60% of British fish that was caught by European boats in, in UK waters. And over here, the European Council saying, uh, no, you're not. If, if you change anything, then we'll make trade much more complicated. Uh, and, uh, and on we went. And even as early, this article was the start of um, uh, 2020, I think, you know, people started to think, hang on a minute, we're gonna have to 
we're going to have to sort of do some deals here. Maybe we won't get everything we wanted on fisheries after all. And so there was, but, but the UK government sort of stuck to its guns, actually, you know, quite a long time, in fact, right until Christmas Eve, as we'll see in a moment, um, trying to get a better deal for, for the UK, but trying at the same time, obviously, to maintain the trade. So finally, we got a deal. Um, yeah, not very relaxing for those of us working on Brexit and fisheries. I was actually booked to do a, a radio interview with the BBC at lunchtime and um, on Christmas Eve, uh, under the anticipation that it would all be announced and actually it wasn't. So I had to kind of guess what was in it, <laughs> which fortunately I got right, which was kind of lucky. I mean, we had a fair idea by then. But just to sort of illustrate how um, important Brexit beca uh, fisheries became in the Brexit negotiations. This is the tie Boris was wearing when he announced the deal. So, yeah, wearing a fish tie, and he and he made some fairly outlandish claims about how good Brexit was going to be for fishing. So, is there any good news? Well, funnily enough, as a uh, as a scientist and somebody who is passionate about sustainability, yes, there is, and. The good news in the uh, Brexit deal really is the commitment towards sustainability. So, for example, this is one of the key sort of uh, lines here that um, there'll be this target to maintain biomass above levels that can produce maximum sustainable yield. And this is in line with what's in the Fisheries Act. So you might think, OK, it's just the same, but that's really important because it provides a check on the UK government. Because if the UK government breaks this deal, there's some very, very severe penalties if it breaks any part of the deal. So it's almost like an independent check uh, on what the UK government is doing. And there was lots of other good stuff in there as well about precautionary principle, long-term sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. Some of this stuff on um, selectivity to protect juveniles and um, spawning aggregations and minimizing harmful effects on the ecosystem actually go a bit further than what's in the Fisheries Act. So again, we have the, the uh, EU sort of, um, you know, uh, acting as an independent check on what's going on here. From a conservation point of view, Brexit does uh, allow the UK government to actually have a lot more control over how its offshore marine protected areas are managed. So Dare I mention Dogger Bank, but this is obviously one of the ones that uh, the, the government is proposing to change the restrictions in. And in this case, to ban bottom trawling to protect conservation features. And it can do that as long as it's not discriminatory. It can't say UK boats are still allowed to fish there, but not EU. The same rules have to apply to all. But this issue, this need in the past to have to negotiate with EU member states has really held up offshore um, conservation efforts. So if the political will is there, then there's the potential to do a lot of good work. Now the not so good news. Um, first of all, there was a lot of uh, fanfare about the 25% increase in quota that the Brexit deal secured. And there's one or two sort of helpful additions. But importantly, if anyone's seen the little sea shanty that was written about this, a fraction of a fraction is less, you know. So it's actually 25% of about 35%. So the final increase for the UK is less than 10%, possibly only as much as eight. Um, swapping quota, which was uh, something that used to happen between individual producer organizations throughout Europe, is gonna be much more difficult. And the vast majority of increases go not to the small inshore boats, which actually, as we see here, make up the vast majority of the UK fleet. Um, most of it goes to large offshore boats. So 40% of all of that 25% goes to one fishery, Western Mackerel, caught off the northwest of Scotland, um, which is predominantly fished by very large pelagic vessels, which are already doing very well financially. One of probably the most disappointing things for particularly in the southwest is the fact that EU vessels are still allowed to fish in the English 6 to 12 mile zone. 
And this was considered to be a red line. The fisheries minister, Victoria Prentice, promised this wouldn't happen. Um, but unfortunately, it has. And, you know, I can only imagine there was sort of a last minute uh, <laughs> caving in on that because it seemed like it would be secured right up until near the end. But yeah, fundamentally, the under 10 meter boats, which make up so much of the fleet, have seen almost no benefits at all, um, despite the fact the Fisheries Act commits the UK government to allocate quota preferentially to local vessels connected to coastal communities like you have in the Southwest that generally fish with a low environmental impact. And uh, yeah, we all know about the issues with um, with trade, the fact that we've gone from a system where it used to just require one or two forms to export catch to Europe, and now it's a 25 step process. Uh, and despite what any, <laughs> any government ministers tell you, this, is, this goes far beyond teething problems. There have been teething problems, no doubt, but fundamentally you have a very, very different and more expensive system for exporting catches. And that's already putting some people out of business. So just to illustrate um, this uh, issue with how the under 10 meter boats are not being benefited, these are the percentage quota increases for lots of different stocks. Don't worry about the numbers on these. Um, this is provided to be by Griffin Carpenter, who a number of you might know. And this is the share in the under 10 meter boats. So if it's high here, that means these stocks are important to the under 10 meter boats. And you can see that actually the increases for the important stocks to these small boats are almost zero. So most of the quota up here is going to the large vessels that are not the stocks that are not fished at all. Um, and as I said, actually, most of the increase, most of that 25% is just in a couple of fisheries. Uh, Western mackerel, North Sea sole and North Sea herring, all fished by large offshore boats. So that for me is, is really disappointing, to be honest, and I'm sure to a, many, a number of others. So what about the future? So this is interesting. Now we've gone through all this sort of hassle of trying to renegotiate a new deal, but to my mind, it hasn't really delivered what it most importantly needed to do and this is a system that's actually adaptable in the face of climate change. We know climate change is already causing redistribution of many species. An IC study you know, found 16 of 21 stocks had moved significantly be between management areas. Uh, we've got a couple of other studies over here led by Steve Simpson and, and Baudrin here, which showed that, you know, again, there were, there, there's been significant movement of fish stocks in the last couple of decades. So the Trade and Cooperation Act just really puts a sticking plaster on this issue. We've, yes, we've changed some things a little bit, but the way the deal is set up is there's no opportunity really to change it beyond the five and a half years because the, the agreement assumes that that will be it after this five and a half year adjustment period. So my call is that, you know, yes, there's been a lot of work put into this new deal, but uh, it's just the beginning. The UK government needs to work with all the relevant member stocks, uh, stocks uh, countries and units that it shares stocks with to develop a more flexible management system that can actually cope with climate change. I managed to get this question put to the EU Fisheries Commissioner a few weeks ago, uh, and she just said, no, <laughs> we're not going to change. Let's let the dust settle before we think about anything else. Um, to my mind, you know, it's taken so much work to get even these small changes. We really need to start working on this now. So I'll leave you with that thought. And for those who were disappointed, there wasn't a scallop on my title slide. Uh, here's one to finish with. So thank you very much. And thanks. thanks to all those guys who really helped among many with this study. Thanks, Bryce, for being the voice of reason and explaining to such complexity uh, so simply. Uh, you're brilliant at it. It's worrying times, isn't it? Still so much uncertainty for us in the fishery and the management of the fishery and how, how will these things change? So, um, yes, we, we remain 
despite all of the certainty that you bring, there's still a lot of uncertainty in how we adapt and manage, which will um, hopefully some, some clarity will be coming. So if we could ask, I'm going to hand over now to, to Martin, who's going to, uh, to, to chair the, the, the Q&A session. So if we could ask all the speakers to come back, um, I'm going to go on mute and hand over to Martin. Thank you very much, Tom. And thank you all four of you for some for four excellent talks. We've um, got a series of, of questions which have come in. Um, what I'll do, I'll read out some of the specific ones for your talks, if you'd like to address those, and then perhaps we can widen it out a bit and have a discussion. Um, so if any of you uh, listening have a question for the panel as a whole, which you'd like to put in the Q&A following these talks, please just add those to the questions um, and start them with at panel and we can spot those at the end and we can perhaps have a, a panel discussion. So please, if you have anything general, there's a couple of ones that were asked, which I actually think are a bit general, we'll come to those. Um, so we have a question, Matt, um, there's a, a, a couple of questions for you, um, which you may have seen. Um, Bob asks, um, have fishers ever contributed to the funding of your project, seeing they are likely to benefit from it? The uh, business supporters scheme that we set up um, we're, we're getting a lot of contributions from businesses, but we're not directly getting contributions from fishers. It's mainly from fish sellers, fish merchants, restaurants, etc. And the, the income from that is, is, a, is, is a help, but it's not enough to keep the project going entirely. So we'd really quite like the income to be from organisations that aren't linked to the fishing industry. That would be the, the best way of doing it, obviously, because we want to be completely impartial. Okay, great, thanks. And there was another one from um, Lucia, um, who's wondering whether your data is just based on landings in Cornish ports, um, and what happens if the Cornish boats land elsewhere, such as Brixham? Um, it, yeah, it is just based on Cornish boats landing to Cornish ports at the moment, but a lot of the data and a lot of the information on the different species is relevant to the whole southwest area. So generally it is pretty applicable to to what's going on in in um, devon waters as well um and there has been talk of maybe there one day being a, a devon or even a southwest good fish guide but um but but nothing's happened of yet as yet okay thanks oh, that was actually also something that she asked whether it's going to be expanded to devon it seems like a great opportunity for brand southwest type um type approach isn't it yeah it's definitely got potential Okay, thanks. Um, there's a couple for Ros. I know, Ros, you've, you've, you've actually answered um, some in the text, which is great. Um, but Samantha asks, um, what your opinion of parlor pots is over less efficient but more sustainable pots? Are there any areas where parlor pots are excluded from the Southwest? Um, I think you, for a definite answer on that, you'd have to talk to the IFCA, specifically Devon IFCA. I'm, I'm not certain if they are banned anywhere in the southwest apart from the Lundy no-take zone. Um, they are more efficient. Um, if, if, you, if it's not economic to fish because you can't fish with parlor pots, then, then you don't have a fishery, but there are things you can do to, to make them more sustainable, like putting in escape gaps or having um, uh, biodegradable panels or hooks so that to, to prevent ghost fishing. So yes, that they, they can be sustainable. They, they can be more environmentally friendly. Okay, um, thank you. And as a question from Charlotte, um, do you have fishery independent data for the stock assessments or is it only landings data? And do you need to improve any of the stock assessments with different data? We, yeah, it's, it's only fisheries dependent we would love to have the resources to, to get fisheries independent data. Um, we're constantly working on ways to, to get better data. Um, there's a lot we don't know about the biology to start with, things like um, mortality and behaviour, because that probably influences um, catches quite a lot. Um, we, we're working on a project to, to try and look at um, or putting cameras in pots at the moment to observe the behaviour of crab and lobster, which will help. But um, also getting good effort data will help as well, which which we it, it's fairly sparse at the moment. 
So are yeah. there any, op any opportunities for others to input into that for um, fishers or sea search or people like this at all? Um, there is a, a crab management group and a science subgroup which is looking to um, gather scientific evidence to, to inform management. So we're, the science group is looking to improve our knowledge basically to help, to help the fishery. I think the aspect of collaboration can really improve, can't it? And I think the um, we started in 2019 doing some catch per unit effort work, working on uh, actually on board the fishing vessels. So this was with volunteers measuring to get an idea of the again, like you, the, the kind of the the population on Scilly and the uh, sort of established some baselines on on the catch per unit effort for. Um, crabs and lobsters but this is as you say the data is remains you know such a small small part of the overall picture I feel we, we, we need to know so much more before we can make better judgments on on the health of the stock yeah absolutely but um you can start with collaboration between scientists and fishers and management you can start to build up, up a complete picture rather than just looking at, at one side of the story Bob, you had your hand raised. Is there a point you wanted to make? Um, no, I, I've got. Um, I put lots of questions in, Martin. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Um, but perhaps um, the, the most the most general. Well, I'll, I'll leave the general one. But I'll ask. Bryce had a wonderful picture. Of, I love the scallop, Bryce. Had a wonderful picture of an offshore wind farm, and I just wonder, relative to the uh, recovery of the seabed, given that the footprint of offshore wind is going to actually increase by six or eight over the next 10 years as it grows, whether in fact a better strategy might be to close offshore wind um, areas to uh, tr bottom trawling and let the seabed recover. But I'm sure there'll be lots of new scallops would love to live in such areas. Um, do you have a view on that? Okay, yeah, so I mean, I'm not an expert on the impacts of, uh, of offshore wind farms, but my understanding is that the main impact is during the construction phase and it and it's predominantly you know the pile driving and things like that which can have negative effects on cetaceans um but there's a lot of work coming out now to show that once they're installed they can actually be quite positive in terms of providing structure um in otherwise fairly structureless environments so, so particularly you know the pylons themselves and then the boulders at the base have been shown to support a range of different biodiversity and be particularly good for crabs and lobsters, for example. So, you know, I think actually, I mean, wind farms are important for bigger reasons to do with t tackling climate change, but there's a lot of positives to come from them. And from what I understand as well, you're not allowed to certainly trawl through wind farm arrays, um, whether or not you could uh, still allow um, static gear fishing, that might be a, a, you know, a nice compromise. And so we can have something that's reducing carbon emissions, providing habitat for sustainable fishing, um, but also protecting the seabed at the same time. So I'm not suggesting that we fill our marine protected areas with, with uh, wind farms, but um, yeah, I think they're going to naturally provide quite a lot of different benefits over the next <laughs> decades, to be honest. Okay, thanks, Bryce. Um, Lauren, we've got a couple of questions for you. Um, Nigel asks, um, believe that wrasse are territorial over their home reefs. So what impact does their removal have on the overall ecology of the reef? Is anything observable and should we be concerned? Yeah, so wrasse are territorial um, and literature suggests that they don't move very far at all. Um, and this obviously leaves them vulnerable to over-exploitation if they're not managed well. Um, Rats are meso-predators, so they sit um, in the middle of the food web. Um, and they're obviously also cleaners um, naturally as well as in, in salmon farms. Um, there's not much evidence in the literature yet of the potential ecological impacts of the fishery and the knock-on impacts um, of unsustainable removal, but um, this is something that I'll be looking at over the next year or so of my PhD. Um, but another part of this analysis that 
um, I presented today, today that I couldn't um, fit into the presentation was looking at the catch composition um, over over the years of the fishery and um, the evidence suggested that the catch composition in each year didn't change, signif change significantly so that suggests that um, the RAS in Plymouth Sound at least are still existing in this like same relative proportions in the wild um, as they as they have been and so despite some declines in uh, Ballam RAS and and gold cine, uh, it didn't actually change the proportions that they're in in the in the wild. So, um, if there were any differences in their ecological function, um, then hopefully it wouldn't um, kind of come out. <laughs> uh, yeah, following that. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's it's a bit of an unknown, isn't it, at the moment? But um... yeah. Clearly, any territorial species, it could well have an impact, I suppose. Um, uh, uh, Bob asked one, actually, in terms of the fact that um, the fish farming industry has been talking about breeding cleaner wrasse, so you don't have to take them from the wild. How are they doing with it? Is there any progress? Is, are we likely to see a decrease in the demand for live fishery? Yeah, so certainly um, in the more recent conversations that I've had, um, Breeding of Ballon Mass in particular, um, Ballon Mass are thought to be the most effective species at cleaning salmon, um, particularly in Scotland. Um, and so attempts to breed them in captivity are, is, are growing, um, but the current numbers that are being produced aren't high enough to fulfill um, the aquaculture needs. Uh, so from what I understand, there'll be a, a year or two off at least um, for being kind of self-sustaining. Um, yeah. So there's a sort of a follow-up question really from Adam in that um, he, he says, um, is there any indication of whether the salmon farmers are changing their preferences over what fish they want in their farms because of experience with them, I guess, in terms of which actually work the best? And is that going to be detectable in your study if that happens? Um, so I, much of the recent evidence suggests that Ballon Mass, um, particularly in Scotland, are the most effective cleaners. Um, I know in, in some of the more colder locations uh, in so in Norway, for example, a lot of lump fish are used because um, the efficiency of RAS aren't, isn't as high in cold environments um, and particularly on the south coast since I started my PhD and since the fishery started in around 2015 um, the most sought after species has been the Ballon Mass so my study I guess doesn't go f go far or go back far enough um, to detect any changes um, but it would be really interesting to look for that kind of evidence in the Norway or Norwegian or Scottish fisheries. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, we, Bryce, um, a few questions for you. Um, one, one of them that... Um, oh, have you just answered one of them? Uh, possibly. About where the money's going to go. From the, the, uh, well, I could, I could elaborate on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, I just went to read it and it disappeared from the open questions. Um, <laughs> I, that thing keeps moving. Yeah, yeah no, so the £100 million... Pounds, um, is not actually aimed at the catching sector. It's aimed at businesses, um, uh, exporters and processors, for example. So, um, you know, they have to demonstrate that they have been affected by um, Brexit challenges. And that's actually quite difficult at the moment because obviously you've still got the COVID restrictions going on as well. And this is sort of muddying the waters in the whole thing. So. The, you know, the fans of Brexit are saying, oh, it's all down to COVID. And of course, the people who are the opponents are saying, no, it's all Brexit. And it's actually quite hard to tell, other than, I think, really, if you use common sense and say, you know, a, a process that used to be really simple is now really complicated. You can, you can, <laughs> you can sort of assume that, the, you know, a lot of the challenges are down to, to Brexit. And it's not just the extra paperwork and the, um, 
you know, the extra admin, but it's the cost as well. So the thing that's really been affected is is what they call groupage, where you uh, a lorry gets um, uh, lots of different consignments from different vessels or even different businesses, and it was then filling up a lorry and going to Europe. And that becomes just mind-bogglingly complicated and almost impossible. So apparently some businesses are finding ways around it by, for example, getting the... Um, the French say lorries to come over to the UK and pick up the consignment. Uh, and that seems to be uh, reducing some of the, the sort of holdups, but that's clearly not ideal and, and not everyone's going to be able to do that. Um, and then there's the whole thing over live shellfish as well, which is, um, you know, really unfortunate. There's this ban on exporting live shellfish uh, and, um, you know, uh, the government sort of denying that this was ever going to happen, but it seems like they knew it was. Um, and so that's a really difficult one to get around. We we could um, depurate the shellfish here, but then that actually dramatically reduces their shelf life. And that therefore not only means you have to get it to market quicker, but it reduces your, the price you get to, for them as well. So you know, a lot of this, it's not just the logistics, it's actually the cost that's eating into profit margins. Yeah. Tom, were you going to add anything there or are you just need Yeah, to... well, there's a, it, well, there's an interesting sort of follow-on question that Paul um, Summerfield was asking about how we can make the inshore fleet more economically sustainable so obviously the brexit has as you've shown bryce you know there's there's been a real impact on um on the inshore fleet particularly so it's it's you know and there's various and i think this is perhaps a question for matt as well in terms of you know the various initiatives of, of terms of uh, micro selling of providing better marketing better um, better access you know, what what's your feeling really on 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 how we can make that that our inshore fishery in the southwest more economically sustainable. Do you, want to, do you want Bryce then, Matt, or anyone oh, else? Okay. Yeah, I'll start. I mean, yeah, again, you know, a strange silver lining of COVID has been the fact that a lot of these um, sort of boat to plate schemes have been set up. And I know particularly about Call for Fish in your part of the world that's been doing a great job of bringing together lots of, um, uh, you know, lots of different vessels. Um, and, you know, you can I can buy a fish from Plymouth up here quite easily, get it the next day. So that's pretty cool. And this is something that people have been trying to do for decades, is to get British people to eat more British fish, and yet failing mostly. And it probably made more progress in the last 12 months than in the, in the previous 20 years. Um, but the other thing about the inshore sector, I think, for me, is, is the fact, and it's been highlighted in most of these talks, that the data on the state of the uh, stocks is really quite poor. And how can you manage, you know, fisheries to their sort of maximum productivity if you don't have good data? And then you risk overfishing or at least fishing at a suboptimal level. And so for me, that's really where the government should be putting a bit more of its money. I mean, I would say that as a scientist, I guess. But yeah, I, I think that's a fundamental problem that it hasn't been addressed. Um, you know, I've been in the UK for 20 years and the, the situation's barely improved. So those two things would be my suggestion. Matt, you getting to add? Um, uh, Bryce summed it up really well. I mean, I think um, programmes like Cornwall This Fishing Life did a really good job and it's an excellent series of just showing how during, you know, during COVID, the fishermen, a lot of them did a great job of becoming their own marketeers and selling their fish um, themselves I think something that we're not very good at in Cornwall and perhaps the rest of the southwest as well like I'm not sure but we're not very good historically at setting up fishermen's cooperatives and actually getting fishermen working together they tend that tends to not be something that they're they're that good at but you know I think it's going to be needed and we need to build on our domestic markets for our seafood um, big problems at the moment with exporting bivalves as Bryce was saying and I think um that's highlighted as well, that we're going to need better facilities for purification of bivalves in our country rather than relying on the French. And so th there is opportunities. I think um, it's, yeah, we've seen in the last year that there is a massive demand and there's an interest in seafood. It's just it's just um, nurturing that and, and getting uh, getting local markets stronger. 
And I think um, that's going to be probably the answer really for the small scale guys. Thanks. Um, Bryce, right, one specific one for you. Then I got a few general questions to ask the whole panel. Um, will TAC still be based on IC stock assessments from Doug Hurds? And I assume that means that what now we're out of the you know, common fisheries policy. So yes, they will. So that's a really encouraging result. So basically, um, ICs will continue to provide the advice for um, management of fish stocks. I mean, m most of the ones that are fished by the UK are shared with the EU, and that is why we had, <laughs> you know, so much to sort out. Over a hundred stocks are shared. Um, the ones that are not, for example, some of the shellfish. I mean, we've seen from Ros about you know, the work that CFAS is doing likewise with scallops, um, the sort of most of the shellfish, which are less mobile, um, are already being uh, based on on pretty decent scientific advice. And, and many of the people providing that advice are also sit on ICs, <laughs> like myself, for example. You know, so, um, yeah, encouragingly, that that should happen. There's a commitment to use the best available scientific advice in both the Fisheries Act and the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. So I think it's as, it's as good as we could hope for. Obviously, we wait and see what happens next, but um, the commitment is there. So that's positive. Okay, that's good. Pos a few positive things is what we need to take. <laughs> I'm trying to. Uh, right, I've got a couple of general questions. Um, feel free to answer these, anybody. Um, I, I think this is kind of targeted to you first, Bryce, but I'll open up to you, the rest of you who work in fisheries management. Um, Bob asks, will anything ever change the balance between pelagic and inshore boats? So we, you, know, you raised the issue that the government have said that they're going to do something about moving the quota. Is anything actually going to change? I mean, it's not so much just pelagic, but it's it's the small versus large boats, isn't it? The under 10 versus the over 10s. Um, oh, I don't know. I mean, it seems, you know, a lot of people had hope that this would be, you know, this the Brexit would, would lead to that change. Um, and, you know, there's, there's obviously been long calls for a redistribution of quota within the UK, even before Brexit. That didn't happen. Then there was the promise made that, Oh, okay. Any any new quota that is achieved through Brexit will be given to the small boats as a priority. But as you've seen, the gains are almost entirely being they, they can't be caught by the small boats. So at the moment, I don't have a lot of hope. But um, you know, I certainly think it would be good for the fishing industry for coastal communities if it could change. I think it's not going to happen in a hurry, is it? I mean because we have a situation where quotas have become a valuable commodity you can't just take them away from people you know some some people have invested uh, you know huge amounts of money in in quota um i'd like to see it change but it's going to take decades to be honest because of that reason and and you know i think we can uh, all we can do is sort of keep trying to push for it because it's it is really important for both stocks and and local coastal communities. Thanks. Um, Tom, Matt, Roz, and Lauren, any of you like to make a comment on that one? Matt. I think we've got to be careful um, with management of sort of non quota species like, like crab and lobster, um, that if we do bring in management to try and control them better, we don't end up with a, a saleable <laughs> quota system you know that gets out of hand a tradable quota i think that could, that could be a real disaster for so whatever happens in terms of management in future years for that that fishery i think it needs to be very carefully thought out so it doesn't favor bigger business um that's just one observation i just um it's matt is right and and bryce too the the quota is kind of one part of it but the it, it's a slow, I, I would like to see a sort of slow and gradual improvement in, in lots and lots of little things from, from the marketing to, to the various bits of support. And, you know, in reality, the fresh, high quality fish from the southwest has a premium and it's really about getting the access to, to the markets. And, you know, there's there's been some really, really good success stories. But ultimately, I, I think it's trying to find ways to that. The fishery itself is more productive and and that means it's you know, finding ways to do the, the as we've heard about the sort of small scale 
good scientifically driven bits of management which can allow you know, the, the pressure to be relieved on some stocks where necessary and, and trying to achieve that that really good science and fishery relationship that one is informing the other i think those that would be really transformational to my mind yeah very much so ross anything to add no worries if not i think it's been quite well covered by bryce and tom um yeah it's it's always difficult when you've got a, a fishing fleet with such a wide variety of of yeah it's such a such a massive difference in say big offshore abbers compared to small part-time day boats so it, it's very difficult to find the right approach for everybody okay well thanks panel um lauren there was a question for you but i'm going to rephrase it because i think it's relevant to everybody to consider there was um a question from mike um mike coulston um and he says um do you think that a fishery that targets slow growing territorial species within marine protected areas, or as he said, the National Marine Park, is an anom anomaly in terms of depleting biodiversity? So I think this is also things like crawfish and as well as some of the ras, some, some other species which are targeted, which can also potentially be a feature in a marine protected area. So is this something which is a complete you know, contrast here that we need to do something about? Um, what, what's your thoughts, Lauren? What's your thoughts about the fact that it, you know some of these, particularly like Ballon Rass, they live quite a long time. Should 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 we really be targeting these within marine protected areas? I guess from my point of view, um, I'm I'm looking at how we can best um, adapt the management of the fishery to reduce any potential impacts um, and. At the moment, the management is is using the best available evidence for the for the species, um, and um, the the new evidence that's sort of come up now from this research and the new data from Devon and Seven IFCA um, has resulted in um, new management measures being put forward for consideration, um, and so hopefully through an adaptive uh, management approach. We'll be able to avoid any any potential impacts um, like that. <laughs> Thank you, um, Tom. Oh, is any rest of you? How, how would you like to address that one? Well, I talk about crawfish. Oh, crawfish is a classic one, isn't it? Because it's it's one of the only species I can think of which is both a a um, a feature of marine conservation zone so it's a conservation feature and it's it's a it's a target species and it's 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 a real conundrum for us because the the data underpinning we you know we know so little about its its ecology and its movement um but equally uh, the the requirement under law is that the the species is, is protected so so on silly we have these small marine conservation zones but in reality our ability to to monitor and know what's going on is is severely limited and my my sense is that with species like this and, and others it, it's taking the kind of wider ecosystem approach where fisheries and 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 species and features within um within conservation zones and mpas are that merges so we, we're sort of focusing a little bit wider and it, it just makes ecological sense to my mind that you're thinking about things not as a you know something we eat or something which is imp you know, important in the ecosystem but it, it's you know it's, it's taking a holistic approach it sounds obvious isn't it but it's it's trying to find ways that we can draw together two different Sort of seams of legislation and two different cultures and, and find a way that, that that one is is collaborating and informing the other that's you know it feels i feel it is you know that it is attainable in this whole approach you know the ecosystem approach which is being talked about but it's really how we make that actually work which is quite elusive but i'm confident we can we can make it work thanks any other panel yeah bryce yeah i mean i'm just gonna <laughs> sticking with my positive outlook um i would say that what you're doing in the southwest with ras is miles ahead of anywhere else so you know i work up in scotland and uh yeah we've seen some very worrying signs of, of ras fishing up there which is effectively completely unmanaged so you know we, we we've got evidence that that ras fishing is completely stripped 
nearly all the RAS from certain areas. And, and you know, I worry about the ecosystem effects of that. I mean, we don't really know how important they are, but they might be quite important. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a bit of a pat on the back, really, for, for what the IFCAs are doing and your work's doing, because it, it is so far ahead. Um, and I think it fits in with what Tom's talking about, about taking this ecosystem approach. You know, yes, we we need more no-take zones. I'm going to put that out there, like you need where nothing can be taken. And hopefully that will happen over the next few years. Um, and that, you know, that's going to protect sort of pockets of, of uh, RAS populations as well as everything else. But at the same time, I think we can work out sustainable levels of fishing that you know, sh shouldn't cause too much problem. Ideally, I guess the aquaculture industry needs to work out how to breed wrasse more effectively, <laughs> and that would so solve some of these problems as well. So, yeah, combination of things for me. Okay, thank you, Bryce. Um, anyone else on the panel matter, Ross, or are you all right with this one? Martin, if you're happy, we've got about another five minutes yeah. before we draw this to a close. Does that sound all right to you? Yeah, that's ideal, because there's one final question which perhaps each of the panel members can give an, a, 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 a thoughts on. And it's, it's, it's two or three questions very similar. So I'm going to phrase it from, from a couple of people about the key messages for 2020 in fisheries in the Southwest. And that's, if there's one specific improvement you would like to see in fisheries in the Southwest or beyond to improve sustainability, what would it be? Right, so I'll start with you. Okay, so I'm going to say more data again, but mm -hmm. I think the way to get that is for, as Ros said, for fishermen and scientists to work together more effectively. And nowadays we have some fantastic, um, yeah, 2021, some fantastic te technology, for example, um, you know, which used in the right way can collect large amounts of data at a sort of scale that scientists could never ever hope to come near and and so yeah we're, you know there's a lot of issues with doing that but it's definitely the way forward and and that way also the industry is involved in collecting the science and also involved in the management as well because they are so much better informed than you know somebody like me about the practicalities of any management uh, measures so yeah that's my take thank you tom I was I was going to say exactly the same thing. You know, it's 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 more, more data informing better management. But I suppose if I take it then one step further, it's that collaboration. Therefore, if you've got the, that kind of fishery science partnership, then you, the logical next step then is that there is a sense of ownership in 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 informing various management decisions. And that's you know that would be a really happy next step from my point of view. Thank you. And Matt, how about coming from a wildlife trust type perspective? Well, there's been so much evidence from all around the world of the uh, the benefit of highly protected marine areas. So, I mean, at the moment we've got we've got MPAs, but very few of them have got actual um, much legislation that's changed what's going on within them in terms of fishing. And yeah, I th I think we need to just grab the bull by the horns and and bring some of these in. But it needs to be done with talking with the fishing industry. I mean, one of the most successful conservation initiatives has been the Travos Bank closure off the North Cornish coast. And that area of the Celtic Sea is really, really vital for many, many species. You know, cod, lots of the flatfish species. Um, um, it's a, a vital spawning area. And by having even a small part of that closed, you know, you could actually see a massive improvement in, in a lot of fish stocks. Um, rather than just being seasonally closed and then being ransacked the minute the uh, the area opens again by uh, bean trawlers. Um, that's one per personal feeling. I think that needs to be thought about and looked at and the fishermen need to be involved. And for now, we have got an opportunity, haven't we, to, to actually bring in something like this. Whereas when we were in Europe, we uh, we would have had to have got the other European nations to back something like that. And so we've got a, an opportunity. I think our, our government should be using it. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Um, Ross, how about from a CFAS perspective, what would you love to see about you know, improvement to fisheries? Um, data has always been the biggest hurdle we've had to overcome. Um, technology is coming on leaps and bounds, and I think we need to make the best use of, of things like cameras on board fishing boats and, and different 
sort of apps and things that can be used to, to record things because it's just harnessing it. It's just getting um, good data that we can then use. To, we've got so many knowledge gaps that, that we just need to think carefully about how to fill them in. So, yeah. And Lauren, you're coming into fisheries management. Um, what, from 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 your your first experiences of it, where, what where do you see it going? What would you like to change? Yeah, I mean, kind of mirroring what everybody else has said, it it's. I think the collaboration part of it is very key, uh, particularly between fishers themselves, scientists, and um, management authorities, um, all working together and sharing data. Um, and it goes back to kind of my, my last slide, um, just that I wouldn't have been able to complete anywhere near as much analysis as I've been able to do without the data and the collaboration between um, the fishers and the IFCAs and bringing that all together. Um, so I think that's really important and feeds into a kind of wider ecosystem management. Super. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, and, and thank you all panelists for your talks and Tom for chairing. I will just pass back to you, Tom, to, to round this off. Yes, well, again, uh, echo that. Thank you, Martin, for working with me on this and to panelists for joining us this afternoon. Really interesting discussion. I think the two main notes for everybody is is firstly that this um, the the um, presentations will have been recorded. They'll be shared on the, the SWME uh, YouTube site and I'll share that that link and you know lastly I, I just it's, it's been really good to be doing this online it's great to be doing um, to be sharing these ideas but and I hope next year that we can perhaps get together in person because it's it's great to have that additional opportunity to, to see everyone in network so with that I'll stop and we'll we'll pause this this session and um, thanks again and we'll see you uh, in the, the new dorm and we can actually get outside and do our research again. Thanks to everyone. Cheerio.